So today we're going to have a look at variance analysis. So first there are some different types of variances. Specifically there's controllable variances and uncontrollable variances. So if you see a budget in your work, what you might see is that a budget is split between a controllable variance, so something that we do have control of, and an uncontrollable variance. So the main differences between the two is an uncontrollable variance is something like inflation or an interest rate percentage change. So at the time that the budget was set, that rate of change will not have been known. So it's not fair to judge somebody who's put a budget together on those uncontrollable variances, because that can often lead to demotivation and potentially an adverse effect on productivity too. So how does management measure a variance? So what they might do is they might go ahead and say, similar to an auditor, if they have a look at variance reports, which they do, and they'll have a variance analysis report at year end that they'll expect you to fill in. They might have a percentage of that variance that they want you to have a look at. So they might say that a variance of 10% is acceptable, but any variance over 11%, they then want a detailed report as to why there's been an adverse or a positive variance in that period. But there are certain items that cannot be measured on a percentage scale, so simply looking at significant variances and percentages that way might not necessarily be the best way to go because even though something might have changed only ever so slightly, so by one or two percent, it could still be material in nature. Another way that management might have a look at variances is by looking at fluctuations. So if there's a business that is seasonal, say a card shop for instance, they're going to be selling a lot of Easter cards, a lot of Christmas cards. There isn't necessarily anything during the summertime, so they might see peaks in say April, March around Easter, and again November, December around Christmas time. So you would expect at those times that there are these peaks in the trend, so more sales volume than there are say in the month of June. So in a business where you have fluctuating trends in the year, they may have a look at accumulated balances. So what an accumulated balance is, is for instance, say if your year end is 1st of December, you might have a look at the accumulated balance from January to September if you're reporting on September to month end. So you're not just looking at September as a month end, you're looking at January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August and September, and then dividing that by nine months and seeing, well, on average, is that there or there about in comparison to the prior year average for that time period and that can often give you sometimes better information than what just looking at that one month would do. One other thing that you might see is that where managers have had a look at the budget compared to what's actually happened in that period they may then re-forecast for the rest of the year so if we can see that there's a trend that's been happening all year for instance our current economic climate then they might decide to then re-forecast those figures because if they were to use the original budget that they'd put into place, that would make no sense now because something's happened that they didn't know about when that budget was being prepared. So they might forecast October, November, December differently to what the budget originally stated and that helps keep controls and gives them a more accurate figure of what they believe will happen in the rest of the year, so the last quarter of the year, if you're reporting 1st, 1st of December. There's various different comparisons that can be made so you might have, for instance, budget versus actual. So the budgeted cost versus what's actually gone through up to this point in time. You might have budget versus the forecast. There they might be looking at, are we going to actually achieve the objectives that we set out in the budget? Original budget versus a revised forecast. So if they've changed the forecast, say again for the last quarter of the year, they might compare those two to see if you're going to get back to the original objectives at the start of the year. They might even have a look at the latest forecast versus the original forecast and see exactly why things have changed and if circumstances are going to get any better or worse. So there are four main reasons for a variance. Now the cause of a variance could be put onto four different headings. So you could have a management error, a planning error, operational factors and anomalies or random factors. Now a planning error might be because somebody's put a budget together that doesn't make any sense or is way out to what's actually happening. So that can set the wrong tone from the outset with a budget. So when you're looking at variances, you're always going to have those variances because the budget was incorrect. Maybe there was some information that was missing at the time, that sort of thing. So a measurement error might be as a result of an incorrect calculation. So say again, if the individual who's preparing the budget has been given timesheets covering 11 months and has based the budget on 11 months when the period that the budget is for is 12 months, 
then that's now a measurement error. Now, you might also have what we call anomalies or random factors that come to play, which are things that, again, most of the time are uncontrollable, things that you don't know about when you're preparing a budget that just come out of the blue. For instance, one of your main supplies of material might go under, so you're unable to get that material at the cost that you would have previously got it at, so you might have to pay a, pr a higher price in the year, and at the time when the budget was prepared, that information was not known, so you couldn't have possibly incorporated that into the budget. Now, some of the operational cost of variances might be due to material price and material usage, so you might have used more to produce warm products than you thought you were going to, or possibly you may have been able to buy in bulk when preparing a budget you didn't think that would be the case, so you might have had cost savings, or you might have done the opposite and budgeted for bulk and not been able to buy in bulk. So for a specific material that you need to produce that product is no longer in stock so you've had to import that from overseas and so you've had additional delivery costs that you might not have budgeted for either. The other operational variance that you might see is on labour. So you will have budgeted for a rate for individuals and their efficiency levels. So if in the past year you had a 95% efficiency and only 5% of individuals got sick, so didn't turn up for work, then you'd use that in the budget. But for instance, you might find this year that 80% of individuals were able to come into work whilst 20% were sick and took those days off. The other thing with the rates that you might not be able to find individuals with the right skill set. So you might have budgeted again for an individual with 60 pound an hour to do a certain job, but now you've had to pay for two individuals 40 pound an hour to do that same job. So that would be a labor rate difference. And the first one would have been a labor efficiency variance. Now there's various different action that you can take on these variances. So you might take a positive action or an adverse action. So a positive action would be say, if labor efficiency was up, then you would congratulate those individuals for doing a good job maybe give them a little bit of bonus, that sort of thing. Now, if you come across something like inefficiency or idle time, the other ways that you can control this is by having a look at the machinery or tools that are being used. So is that a factor as to why individuals are not being able to produce as much as what you had budgeted for? For instance, is there a machine that keeps breaking down? Are there power cuts? Do they not have the correct tools required to do the job? Is there not enough tools? that sort of thing. So you can assure that there's proper maintenance of those machines. You can assure that there's enough tools for them to do the job. So let's now move on to cost variance analysis. So a cost variance analysis is the difference between the standard cost of an item and its actual cost. So cost invariances are usually measured depending on the element of that cost. So you might have materials, labour, fixed, semi-variable, variable, so imagine the standard cost of one unit is three pounds per kilograms. And to make one unit, we require two kilograms. So to create that one unit, we've got three pounds and three pounds. So it's six pounds to create that one unit of production. So if we look at the standard cost of producing 1,000 units of production, then it takes two kilograms for each unit. So we're going to require 2,000 kilograms to make 1,000 units and the cost of that would be times 3. So if we require 2,000 units times by 3 that means it's going to cost us £6,000 to produce 1,000 units and that's under the standard costing. Now if we find out that the actual cost is only £2 per kilogram then we still require 2 kg for one unit so 1,000 units is still going to be 2,000 kilograms but at two pound then it's only going to cost 4,000 pounds so the standard of 6,000 pounds minus 4,000 pounds gives us a positive variance of 2,000 pounds so that example there is the price variance but you might also have something called the usage variance so let's have a look at another example where, in this case, the standard cost of one unit, again, requires 2 kg and it costs £3. So again, if we want 1,000 units of production, then we require 2,000 kilograms at £6 because it's 2,000 times by the £3 per kg to get to 6,000. However, if the actual process uses 
2,200 kilograms at a cost of just two pounds, then what are we going to have for the price variance and the usage variance? So we need to put this into two different parts, basically. So the price variance, firstly, is going to be the quantity that we've actually purchased times by the actual price. And we're then going to compare this to the quantity actually purchased times by the standard price. So the quantity that was actually purchased was 2,200 kg. Now, if we times that by the actual price of two pounds, that's 4,400 pounds. And if we times 2,200 by the three pounds, that gives us 6,600. So if you take 6.6K minus 4.4K, that gets you to 2.2K. So that, there's a positive variance of 2.2K or 2,200 pounds. Now we need to look at the usage variance as well. The usage variance is calculated as the quantity actually purchased. So again, 2,200 kilograms times by the standard price. So our, our 6,600 pounds, and we're going to compare that to the quantity that should have been purchased originally. So just the 2,000 kg times by the standard price. So what we would have had was 6,600 minus 6,000. So the 6,000 is the 2,000 kilograms times by three pounds. And the one over here is the 2,200 kg times by three pounds. So the difference between the two is 600 pounds. So let's move on to variance analysis with absorption costing. So let's just imagine that in the budget, production units were 1,000 and we expected to use 600 kilograms of direct materials, which would have cost us 5,000 pounds. Instead, we actually produced 1,200 units instead of the 1,000 that we budgeted. And we actually used 700 kilograms, which cost 6,000 pounds total. So what we need to do here is work out what the direct material price variance is as well as the direct material usage variance. So if we have a look at what the price variance is going to be, if we use the calculation of standard price times by quantity actually used minus the actual price times quantity actually used, then what we can do is divide the £6,000 of actual cost divided by the 700 kilograms, which gives us £8.57 per unit which might be useful if in an exam they ask you what the unit price is. And next we have the 700 kilograms actually used times by the standard price, which was £8.33, which is worked out as the £5,000 of cost divided by the 600 kilogram used as standard. So if we do the 700 kilograms times by £8.33, that gets us to £5,833. So if we deduct the actual cost of £6,000, we get a variance of more to £7. Next, if we want to work out what the direct material usage variance is, what we need to do is take the quantity purchased times by the £8.33. So the quantity purchased was 1,200 units. So we want to take the quantity purchased, which was 700 kilograms, times by the standard price per unit of £8.33, which would get us the £5,833. And then the second half, what we're going to do is take the 600 kilograms that we originally had in the standard costing divided by the 1,000 units that we had in the standard costing and we're going to times that by the 1,200 units that we actually had. So that's going to give us 720 kilograms. So if we take the 720 kilograms and times that by the standard unit price of £8.33 recurring, that will give us £6,000. So now, if we take the 5,833 minus the 6,000, that gives us a variance of 167, which is a favourable variance. So I hope you found this video useful. Consider subscribing as always, and I shall see you on the next video.